Men rising up to end the silence around us about the chains that bind us, to dispel the darkness of illusion with luminous spiritual technologies, to finally become the hero within us all. I am Karuna Avatar Das. With me is my dear co-host Jai Jagannath Prabhu on Arise, the Honest Man's podcast. And we have uh, the most esteemed Chaitanya Charan Prabhu with us today. Um, we are so immensely grateful to have Prabhu with us again for the second time. He was with us two weeks ago or three weeks ago. But uh, unfortunately, there were some uh, connectivity issues and we, we were unable to... Um, we were unable to have a a uh, a podcast with Prabhu, and today we were just before we we came on, we were experiencing a little bit of uh, glitchiness as well, um, and we are really hoping that uh, everything is going to be okay today. Uh, so please just pray with us to Krishna that that he allows the internet connection to be <laughs> to be. Um, yeah, to flow. So uh, I just would like to. Last time I, I I gave this introduction for Prabhu, but I would I would really like to just introduce him nicely a second time. He is really a most uh, esteemed, qualified personality. So Chaitanya Charan Prabhu is a monk. He's a mentor and a spiritual author. He's done his electronics and telecommunications engineering degree from the Government College of Engineering in Pune, and he uh, subsequently served as a software engineer in a prominent multinational software corporation. Uh, he travels all over the world, uh, from Australia to America, giving talks on spiritual subjects in universities such as Princeton, Harvard, Stanford, and Cambridge, as well as companies like Intel, Google, Amazon, and Microsoft. He's also the author of 25 books, um, and then he's the author of the world's only Gita daily feature, wherein he writes uh, daily a 300-word inspirational reflection on a verse oh. from the Bhagavad Gita. Till now, he has written over 1,700 Gita meditations that are posted on GitaDaily.com and are read daily uh, by thousands from all over the world. He also answers questions by spiritual seekers on his site, thespiritualscientist.com, where his over 3,500 audio answers and several hundred articles are available. His articles have been published in many national newspapers, including Indian Express Economic Times and Times of India in the Speaking Tree column. Uh, then, he is also a member of ISKCON's leading intellectual body, the Shastric Advisory Council, and is the associate editor of ISKCON's global magazine, Back to Godhead. So certainly such a multidimensional, um, yeah, greatly qualified person. And we have him for a very interesting subject matter today. And Jai Jagannath Prabhu will lead us into that. Thank you, Chaitanya Sharan, for joining us again. <laughs> Thank you, bro. Hopefully, Finally, three times to make this happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, the topic is, I've, I've titled it as transforming um, chaos into order because I'm seeing in my head, I'm thinking of journaling as like a, like a logos, you know, and, and you know, in Eastern philosophy, they say in the beginning there was the logos and the logos turned, you know, the darkness into the order of the universe. And so I'm kind of, mm -hmm. I kind of envision language or shabda or journaling as a sort of logos that can help deal with the chaos inside and bring it into order so that we may be, you know, directed in our activities properly in the outside world. So that's how the title came about. So it's about journaling. And, it, you know, when I, I, the reason I wanted to say that, because if you just say journaling, it sounds like such a wimpy thing. I, I don't know why, like, it, it kind of like strikes you, like, what is that going to do in the modern age? So let's start off, like, what is journaling, like how you conceive of journaling and how did you stumble upon it as a personal, let's say, practice in your own life? Okay. So first of all, thank you for inviting me here and thank you for tolerating all the inconveniences with which we finally got here. <laughs> I've seen several of your podcasts and very thought-provoking and stimulating. It's an honor to be here. And for me, I would say journaling has come from three different directions. Hmm. 
first is uh, my love for words <laughs> second is my tendency for introspection and third is my my aspiration to share spirituality as a resource for helping people raise their consciousness mm. so i just love words like <laughs> one of my hobbies in childhood was just picking up a dictionary and memorizing words so so i would say that uh, i love sanskrit words but i love english is like my home language although it is my second language but so i love to think and you know words serve two purposes no we you okay there is a lag here isn't it a little no, bit. we can hear you fine. We can hear you fine, though. No problem. No problem. Okay, fine. Okay, Krishna. Okay, Krishna. Now. So let fine. me share something. Mm -hmm. So, you know, words broadly serve two purposes. We often think of words as simply as tools to express our thoughts, mm. but words are also tools for discovering our thoughts. Mm. So the more we Very like you nice. talk about logos so when we say generally we realize the power of word to discover our thoughts when somebody tries to do reflective listening with us <laughs> you sound upset i'm not upset i am enraged <laughs> oh okay so what happens is when you write things down i find that the thoughts themselves become clearer mm. so first of all so words i found so there was a love of words and i always liked introspection so i found words and in words and journaling both came together for me to do introspection very powerfully mm -hmm. and so i also approach i thought i thought about third thing is that how i like to share spirituality so this is let me make this a full screen so broadly you know that we could consider spirituality from three different perspectives there's textual traditional and applicational Mm. so textual refers to you know what does this verse mean what are the different comment explanations of this verse or this word or this concept how do the how does the text flow that's textual spirituality hmm? so we have a rich tradition of textual spirituality in acharya's commentaries in the bhagavad gita and bhagavatam for example then traditional spirituality largely talks about the the beliefs and practices the philosophy and the practices of particular traditions mm. so in general when we as devotees talk about applied spirituality you know it we are largely talking about traditional spirituality because we talk about applying spirituality means applying bhagavad gita means chanting the holy names right. or worshiping the deity now now in the outside world when people talk about applying spirituality they are thinking of something else they think <laughs> about how can i make my life more meaningful and purposeful how can i become more understanding and forgiving how right. can i connect with myself better so so how can i get more emotional stability so basically what i try to do is that try to find ways these at the intersection of these three mm. so how do we get over here so you know so for me in one sense journaling is a tool to gain and share spiritual insights so i'll sh share one more thing over here this is a model of the self i use this is based on 342 in the bhagavad gita right we know indriyani paranya hur indriya bhya param mana so senses are about the world about them is the mind about them is the intelligence and about them is the soul right so i divide the into two parts we could say that the soul and the intelligence are the reflective self hmm hmm and the mind and the senses are the impulsive self the part of us which uh, thinks and analyzes is the reflective self the part of the part of us which just wants to act without thinking that's the impulsive self <laughs> so this is a model to understand the two selves mm. now krishna talks about this in 65 in the gita he says elevate yourself with yourself right. don't degrade yourself with yourself so what i see this is journaling is a tool 
to create a dialogue between the reflective self and the impulsive self. Hmm. So what journaling does is, say for example, uh, certain things happen in my day to day. Say I yelled at someone, or I overate, or I overslept, whatever I did. So then I look back. Okay, what were the thoughts that prompted me to do that? When I look back, then I start seeing. Okay, this was the impulsive self speaking, and this is what the impulsive self speaks. So in this way, the more the reflective self comes in charge, then the more the impulsive self can be uh, restrained. Now the impulsive self is not always bad. Sometimes we get good ideas also. <laughs> but, right. <laughs> but in general. i see journaling as a way to bring these two selves in dialogue with each other so what if you see the previous image so basically journaling first thing it does it it distances the two you can separate the two basically mm. okay this is the reflective self this is the impulsive self and you know the more we journal the the strong, greater can become the distance between the two mm. now they don't, don't necessarily have to have a distance but having the distance helps bring about a dialogue because mm. otherwise it's difficult to know which self is speaking <laughs> when i am getting angry with someone am i being aggressive or am i being assertive mm. does the situation call for it or is it just i am letting my emotions control me mm. so i found that seen in this way so journaling gives spiritual insight so when i do, i do seminars on journaling i done it for indian audiences western audiences so actually they start saying that you know this idea of impulsive self and reflective self this is real you can actually see it in action hmm. and then when we show that this is based on the bhagavad gita that the bhagavad gita talks about these two models of the self elevate yourself with yourself don't degrade yourself with yourself they, that actually helps them gain interest and even faith in the bhagavad gita right so so there are many people to who talk so in one sense journaling gives spiritual insights if seen in this way and secondly uh, there are many people who talk about journaling but while journaling there is no philosophical foundation for journaling so spiritual insights we can also journaling gains from spiritual insights so i used to journal before i was introduced to bhakti and wow. now uh now when i do it actually it is much more fruitful because mm. i'm not just writing my thoughts or writing my events i'm actually a, getting a better understanding of what is happening in my inner world mm. so and somebody says you know what is the point of journaling what is the use i say that you know we spend time reading news we want to stay in touch with the world <laughs> but what about staying in touch with yourself mm. staying in your own emotions saying what are the emotions that are driving you what are the emotions that are dominating you what are the what what is it that making us tick and then what is what is it that is making us trip <laughs> so <laughs> so i feel that journaling does help a lot so for me you could say journaling is both a tool for outreach and a tool for enrich mm. if we use the word mm. 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 so uh -huh. that's the broad introduction I mean that's an amazing introduction. I feel like I'm in a seminar. I'm like taking like all these notes. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I've got like extensive notes already. <laughs> um, I have a follow-up question to this. First of all, I want to say that's a fantastic introduction. You know, just in general, one of the attractive features of Indian philosophical systems in general is its practice of taxonomy, like this ability to like categorize things so that yes. th that we can discern clearly and then have deeper conversations not only outside but within ourselves so that was like a very beautiful taxonomic presentation that you just gave that made everything like really amazingly clear i my follow up question um cuz you said you got into journaling before you met the devotees and i'm suspecting that you're a little bit older and so i just feel like older generations didn't have the the um tension of digital media that mm. the newer generations have and digital media is like a very powerful seductive force bringing us to engage with the outer world and away from ourselves as you say and i feel like older devotees even myself i'm a, a little bit older cuz the the whole technology explosion was just starting to happen when i was in the 6th grade 
So I'm still a little bit older. I had like a, a normal upbringing in that sense. So I did like growing up, I read a lot of books. I did a lot of writing. But as digital media started to become more part of our lives, there's like a lot of competition for yourself with this outer seductive force. And so how do you, how do you, because you've already, already discussed what is journaling and why it's important. And it was in the, like very succinct and amazing. How does one deal with this, these new forces for your inner authority um, in the form of like digital media specifically? That's true. It's, it's a big challenge if you want to get distracted. You know, I write on the Gita every day. So I wrote an article on 1617. Aneka Chitta Vibhanta says that, you know, there is ever increasing competition among ever increasing distractions for mm. ever decreasing attention spans. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, Krishna, yeah, yeah, that's well stated. I, I, I just want to add. Wait, I just want to add that again for clarity. Yeah, yeah, please. So there is ever increasing competition among ever increasing distractions for ever decreasing attention spans. Screw the avatar, you have to ask, wow. No, that's just like, gosh, that's just like, that's so depressing. I'm just like, oh my God, because I'm experiencing it so viscerally. It's just, um, you know, there's also just this common phenomenon that like, you know, everyone says these days, yeah. like when I try to, you know, when people, like when I try to read a book, you know, then it's like concentrating, concentrating. Mind, 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 mind just like freaks out, you know, and you just you just can't like can't be there. This is just a very common experience these days. And personally, just when I think about um, when I think about journaling and the need for because goodness gracious, I have such a need to do it. You know, there's so much chaos in the inner world and it needs to be done. Mm. But my big challenge is already that life is just so full. You know, and it seems like journaling is something very intentional, very intentional, very like deeply reflective. So just where where to find the time, you know, it, and then and then where to find the content. Like even if you make the uh, make the time, how to concentrate and do it properly. OK, yeah, that's a tough question. And I would say that the answers will vary from person to person. Mm. But somehow, you know, I am quite comfortable with digital media in the sense that the last seven, eight years, I have been constantly traveling. Almost nine months a year before the pandemic, I was traveling across the world. Mm. So I have, you can say, I all, the only time I touch a physical Bhagavatam is when I'm giving a Bhagavatam class in the temple and I pick up the Bhagavatam <laughs> at that time. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so I'm quite comfortable with the online media and I also journal uh, digitally, mm. not just uh, journal on the phone or on the laptop, but I have also started extensively using text to speech for journaling. Mm. So I dictate my journal mm. and I find that extremely helpful. In fact, uh, you know, when you said about where to get time for journaling, so I, I have done four courses on journaling from different perspectives. But one of the things which I suggest is that you know, just after every, you can put a, a timer in your phone and maybe after every hour or after every three hours, just pause for a minute and just speak to yourself what you did in the last three hours. Mm. Wow. Just that activity, just that activity, what happens is articulation activates the intelligence. Mm. Otherwise, you, we are so caught in doing things. Right. Just trying to articulate, okay, what did I do? That itself brings a certain amount of reorientation, refocus. And uh, so I find that even if we don't have exclusive time for journaling, now there are apps on the phone itself. And, and more, most phones have fairly good text-to-speech. In fact, mm -hmm. I would say that uh, most, uh, most of your readers, I'm Indian, and my English is, is Indian-accented. But for all of you... <laughs> It would be much easier to, for text to speech to catch your English. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I would say that just starting from there, just that spend half a minute to a minute. Okay, what did I do in the last hour? What did I do in the last two, three hours? Mm. That itself, you know, yeah. brings a refocus back. It makes us think about what we are doing. If we are going off track, it helps us come back on track. 
Yeah. So that's, that's a simple way to start journaling. And then if you use this model of the impulsive and the reflective self, yes. then, you know, did I give into my impulsive self in the last one hour, last two hours? Hey, you know, I, that person, that friend sent me a link and I could have, I was reading my Shastra, but I reading scripture, but I just clicked on that link and wasted half an hour. Maybe I should have avoided that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's, I find that uh, digital media, also, it, it, it is a source of distraction, mm. but it can also be a source of reorientation. Mm. So, if we adapt more, ad, ad, adopt rather, adopt more contemporary forms of journaling, that's quite helpful. Right. I have a I have a follow up to that because for those of us who grew up bombarded with the digital media, our algorithms run our mental algorithms run a lot different than the older generations when dealing with digital media, because we grew up on digital media. So how we engage with it is very different than how our older generation tends to engage with it, having not grown up with it. And so, like for us. Like, yeah, we can, there's an app for journaling and that could be helpful for us. But then I'm wondering, do we lose something in that, like just writing, like with a pen and paper, for example, here are my, here are my, um, my notes. I, I have here maybe a distinction between writing, speaking and typing, um, like writing with pen and paper and then like speaking into an audio thing and then typing. There seems like there could be maybe they're all valuable in different ways and I'm intuiting that. So maybe you can speak to that because I feel like someone like me who's kind of caught in between two generations a little bit. So I didn't grow up fully digitized, but I'm largely yeah. converted to the, to the digital world. And so for me, using an app may not be as helpful than like actually writing something down, like moving a little bit slower than I'm accustomed to doing because of the way my mental algorithms are. Anyway, I was wondering if you could no. speak to that. Yes. See, the, in my journaling seminar courses, the first thing I say is that journaling is a very individual activity. Right. So each of us has to find out how journaling works the best. Mm. So <clears throat> for me personally, because I said that uh, for me, I just love to be in touch with words. Right. So <laughs> anything can be an excuse for me. So, uh, so I don't, I don't mind it, but I, I know several other friends who journal, they say that, uh, they can't do it unless they have a physical book to journal. Mm. And then I find it not very convenient because if a physical book, then if I want to retain it, I have to scan it. Then the scan doesn't may not be editable text. So in one sense, I would say I am more utilitarian in my approach to journaling, Okay. but it, 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 it depends. I'm sure there are others who feel that physical journaling is the best mm. and some who may feel that digital uh, typing is better than speaking. So yeah. I would say that each of us has to discover. Mm. But uh, so there are two different things over here. One is just starting the activity of journaling, which was the earlier question. So I said we could start it with technology itself. Mm. So just start speaking about journaling, speaking about speaking to not just record what we have, ha what we have done, but to maybe a little assess what we have done. Mm. So, but as we become comfortable, as we start become habituated to journaling, then we can find out which is the way that works best for us. Mm. Mm. Just, you know, Prabhu, you were saying that um, when you write things down, the thoughts themselves become clearer. I, I really, really find that. Like whenever I have some difficulty in my life, like some serious thing that that is um, that is there, then I find that if I if I write, especially when I write to someone, then it, it really, really helps me in, the, in that regard. But actually just, and I think for me, because you're saying like use uh, speech to text technology, I love voice notes. Like I love sending people voice notes. That's really like something that is one of my favorite activities. I think that's probably the shape that it takes for me in one sense almost automatically because I it's like also just, you know, relationships and when you share with people, they appreciate and so on. So maybe I'm already doing a sort of journaling just by sharing with, with, with friends. But I guess, you know, it's also like there are, I think one thing which is very helpful about journaling is that it gives us the ability or it gives us the space to say really intimate like private things or like or like dark heavy thoughts that we wouldn't want to necessarily express to others um 
you know, so, so, th and that, that's a very unique space in that regard, because it's like, it's like a very private reflective activity. Mm. Yes. So, yeah. So, you know, somehow till now I have never felt worried about uh, the privacy of my journals, maybe <laughs> because I have used digital, digital journals and I keep uh, passwords and other things, but I, yeah, that is a major concern for many devotees. But overall, I have not many devotees, many people in general. But uh, yeah, uh, it is uh, in journaling, two things happen basically. First is that uh, we can voice thoughts which we dare not voice with anyone else. And secondly, you know, we can assess them. So I'd just like to share my screen once again. Yes. Um, the same, same thing, so slightly different here. So uh, when you, you told me that you, journaling can help deal with difficult issues. So I have a model for that also. Mm. Now, of course, what I do is if there is any difficult issue, the inner dialogue. So if I'm worried about something, so you could say broadly, there are the three voices inside us. There's the voice of the dreamer, there's the voice of the realist, and there's the voice of the cynic. <laughs> and say that if I decide that I'm going to read the whole Srimad Bhagavatam in the next one year, and the voice of the cynic may say, oh, yeah, we'll never be able to do it. You have so many things to do. You don't have the discipline, you have too many excuses, whatever. So now what happens is that when I journal, so I don't, I don't always journal by dictating. There are times when I type also, mm. especially when dealing with issues. So one of the things I do at those times is that just if some issue is burdening me, just write everything about that issue, write it out. Hmm? And mm. then just that release, like you talk about the private space, just releasing things from inside. See, as long as thoughts are inside us, they congest us. Yes. It's just actually thoughts are meant to help us think. But sometimes too many thoughts going round and round, they stop, they paralyze thinking. Yeah, I, I so, call it a, this thing you're talking about as psychic evacuation. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great word. Psychic <laughs> evacuation. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. It's actually, it is also to have a psychic excavation. Mm. It's a, mm. at one level, we evacuate what is crowding, but then we go deep inside also to bring out what is hidden. <laughs> You really are kind of a wordsmith. I'm really appreciating this. <laughs> yeah. So just to complete this. So what happens is just get it out. Uh, and then just that gives a sense of release. Then maybe after a day or so, and we're relatively in Sattva Guna, come back and look at it. And then whatever I've written down, I try to put a label to this. This is the dreamer speaking. This mm. is the realist speaking. This is cynic speaking. Mm. And then that itself gives a sense of relief. Now, there are times when we need to be, maybe cynic is a strong word. I could use the word critic over here. But mm -hmm. cynic is also fine. That there are times when we need to listen to the critic within us. There are times when the dreamer is to be listened to. There are times when the realist. But what happens is, as soon as we understand these three voices are there, and we can see to some extent that is which voice is speaking what, then we don't get carried away by that voice. So, mm -hmm. one of when Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that wherever and whenever the wind wanders, get it back under the control of the self. Mm -hmm. So, one way to do that is to identify, hey, this is the dreamer speaking. Okay, let me come back to the ground. What can I do right now? So, identifying the distractor, it actually, it takes the power out of the distraction. Mm -hmm. So, I say that don't identify with the mind, identify the mind. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. so, don't identify with the critic, the cynic, identify the cynic. Mm. So, when I do that, then, then sometimes it may be right also, but at least I don't get involuntarily carried away with it. Mm. So, I find this threefold framework, it, it is a very powerful tool for analyzing different difficult issues and come to a reasonably grounded understanding. So in some situations, we may decide, yeah, I want to dream. I want to do something ambitious over here. Mm. Nice. I um, I have sort of two categories. I have another category of questions I want to get into specifically revolving how you've used journaling to help 
men, to mentor men. And I, I kind of want to get into that. But before we do that, I do have a few other questions in this just sort of introductory phase of this conversation. Yes, I also just want to say at this point, Prabhu, while you're sharing these very helpful like little tools and schemas with us in the realm, perhaps if there's any other particular little tools that, that you think you could just inform us about just in a very educational way, maybe that could also be a good time to do so right now. Okay. Yeah, and I had a question yes. about a tool in that regard because one thing that um, – the conversation between the reflective self and the impulsive self, I've personally found in the past when I've journaled for periods of time that the conclusions, taking the conclusions of the reflective self and transforming them into action. And when that doesn't happen, it like discourages the journaling process. I don't know if that makes sense. Like, in other words, you've kind of identified the two selves, so to speak, and you've come to certain decisions by reflection, as is makes sense, that's kind of the function of the intelligent. But if it doesn't transform into action, then somehow it's discouraged my journaling process. Like what was the point in reflecting and coming to conclusions if I haven't transformed them into actions? So I don't know if you've experienced, I doubt that you yourself oh, experienced yeah. that, but you must have seen that. And um, I guess my question is concerning how to transform the conclusions of the reflective self into action. And when it doesn't happen, how to remain encouraged in this still very helpful practice. Oh, yeah. You know, of course, I have experienced it all the time. I mean, every day, I, every day I look back. In fact, I would say that every day I journal, it's almost like I can count more times when I got carried away by my impulsive self. <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> in one sense, we become more aware and more alert. Mm. But having said that, one of the things which is I feel vital is choosing our battles. Mm. That there are some areas in which, uh, in which the impulsive self might just be too strong right now. Mm. And uh, if that is the case, then I feel that uh, we need to be kind to ourselves. Hmm. So, so you know, many times uh, devotees and those who are coming to spirituality, they get discouraged when they get caught in the internet. In the internet now, there are so many distractions, and especially sensual distractions are there. Hmm. And devotees are trying to move purely. They feel very disheartened by that. So one thing which I say is that you know, in today's world, probably in fifteen minutes we can see more obscenity than what people in the past could see in their entire lifetime. <laughs> right. Absolutely. So now the point I'm making through this is that actually maybe our technology has become too strong for our morality. Right. Maybe the human moral muscles are just not strong enough to deal with such technological, such levels of technological distraction. Right. So if something like this happening, I, I, my suggestion is that, if some temptation or some distraction is too difficult to overcome, just be kind with yourself and focus on other areas. Mm. Focus on areas where we can catch the impulsive self and we can restrain ourselves. So maybe I can't, once I get on my phone, I just spend some time surfing and I can't avoid it no matter how much I try. Okay. But maybe when I am, when I'm eating, maybe I can regulate my eating and I can avoid overeating. Maybe when I'm talking and I tend to gossip and notice I'm gossiping, maybe I can avoid that. See, in the inner journey, unless we encourage ourselves, oh no, he's about to drop, <laughs> drop the bomb. <laughs> we lost that. So, I so I said that. Can you? I said that. Actually, unless we learn to encourage ourselves, yes, right. There'll be hundreds of there'll be hundreds of reasons to be discouraged. Mm. So that's why now, I would like to share one more slide in this connection itself. Now, what I say is that, for all of us, we have had certain relationships that have nourished us. Maybe it is a. So this dialogue between the reflective self and the impulsive self. For it to not become too critical to ourselves, 
I suggest that we model this dialogue on the most nourishing relationship that we have had. Mm. So, so if the most nourishing relationship is that of it, if I had a teacher who was very encouraging, inspiring, then envision the reflective self as the teacher and the impulsive self as the student. Mm. Mm. And generally, this is helpful when we want to be educated, when we want to clearly understand certain concepts. Mm. Then another relationship which can help us grow is a parent-child relationship. You know, if we had a loving parent, and then we could envision the reflective self as a parent. So in mm -hmm. one sense, uh, uh, when devotees have journaled, and now the students in the journaling course have journaled, they said that after some time they model it, they can say, they can hear their mother speaking to them through their journal. So, or they can hear their teacher speaking to them through their journal. Mm. So we consider the reflective self as the parent and the impulsive self as the child. This is largely when we need some, you know, maybe loving care, tender loving care. And of course, there are times when we need to be pushed. And usually it is our boss who pushes us. <laughs> so, <laughs> and sometimes, sometimes, you know, we need some taskmaster to get us out of our lethargy and to get things done. So if we had some authority figure who really pushed us, but who made us do things, which now we look back and we feel happy about, we feel proud that we at least did some things, not proud in an arrogant sense, but proud in a grateful sense that we were able to do some service, then we could envision the reflective self as the employer and the impulsive self as the employee. Okay, so how did you spend your time today? So I would say that depending on the phase we are in our life, we, we are sometimes in the phase when we want to achieve things. Mm -hmm. So during that time of journaling, say if I'm writing on a book and I have a deadline, say if I had to complete a 50,000 word book in the next one month, then I would largely envision my journal, my journaling as a dialogue between the employer and the employee. <laughs> the, right. So how much, how, how did, how much did you write today? How, how was your quality of writing? How, how, how did you get distracted? Now, there are times when, when we are wounded by life. You know, at that, that time, maybe the parent-child mode of journaling is much better. And mm. you're just trying to heal. You're trying to process what has happened. Mm. And this first one, I recently just completed a seminar on uh, journaling to study scripture better. Wow. So what I did in that is that we did exercises that take up a scriptural passage and if you have 15 minutes to, of, of time, read it for 10 minutes and write your thoughts about it for five minutes. Mm. And you know, there is a quote of Prabhupada where he says that every day, write something. What is your realization? Write it. In fact, there are many quotes of Prabhupada, but this is one quote which is, I find very infrequently used. Or so this is a very powerful tool. And I find that writing about what we are reading mm. we don't have to share it with anyone that actually brings us so much closer to scripture wow i feel right for me the gita daily articles that i've been writing you know that you mentioned that about 1700 articles that was about five years ago now i have about 5000 articles on the gita. <laughs> <laughs> so, actually they started as uh, you know my notes on the gita Mm. And I would read some words and I would find, hey, this is a good point. And I would try to articulate it in my way, my words. And I started sharing that. So I find that uh, among all the scriptures, I, I can say I have the closest relationship with the Gita, not so much with the right. Bhagavatam. I'm trying to develop it now, not so much with the Chaitanya Charita Amrit. So if you want to be educated, if you want to understand some concepts, the journaling can help us in that also. Mm. So I would say these are the tools for there's some of the tools which you could use in journaling. That's absolutely incredible. Um, you know what's coming up for me? Um, I realized when bringing the inner world, this is a realization, so one can take it or leave it, but I realized when dealing with the inner world, there's a language that I use to articulate what's going on, which is why journaling, mm. is, this is why we have this topic. And then there are, other, there are three other things I notice happens that would help me to bring my inner world to order the stories that I'm telling myself, you know, cause I'm using language to build a story where I'm the main True. character of the story. And depending on how I build a story, it's gonna impact how I feel and how I respond to things. So I feel a story. And then the third one I have, and which is why I'm bringing up this question is the imagery 
or images or imagination, which is kind of similar to story storytelling, but it's a little bit distinct because you were saying how you can see the reflective self as like a caring nourisher when you need to be like uplifted and encouraged. And if you need to be pushed, you can imagine the reflective self as, you know, someone who's challenging you and helping you to meet those particular goals. So it seems like these images are like a really important aspect of journaling insofar as, you know, you're building all this stuff with language in your head, ultimately. And then the last part is what you also already mentioned is just like philosophy or like there's a metaphysics that governs the stories that you tell yourself, the language that you're using and the images that are invoked, there's a metaphysics behind that. So all these factors become really critical and helping to govern and discover things in the inner world. I'm curious about this image thing because, and this maybe if, if, unless Karuna has some more questions around the tools, this might be a transition question to what I, the other part of this conversation. I find that the images of men today is very demoralized. Like we, at least here in America, we don't have a lot of good images of men that we can look up to. You know, all the, all the images of men are like either superheroes with, who are literally not grounded <laughs> and they're just flying around in the air. So they don't really teach us so much about how to exist on the ground in, in a sort of normal way. Or they're like images of like fathers who are like either not there or are who are foolish. And so I personally found over the years that the demoralized image of men has also demoralized that image of men that I embody to whatever degree. And so when I look towards a nourisher, for example, in that particular example of the reflective self, you know, the first image that comes up may be like my mother, which is not bad. But I'm also wondering if we don't have positive imageries of men to help push us forward, is something lost in that? And this is kind of this is intended as a sort of transition question because I want to hear about how you've used journaling to help your those you mentor. You mentor men also, and I was curious about how you journal. But before we get into that, just kind of the demoralized image of men and how that impacts our own self image as men and how that would impact our journaling about it also. That's kind of what I'm asking here. Hmm. Uh, this is, I would say one of the most distinctive differences between say the East and the West. Hmm. I don't think that, uh, that accusation of toxic mas masculinity or anything like that has come into the Indian psyche so much. Hmm. Hmm. And uh, India is largely aspirational. So I didn't face this challenge in my outreach in India. It's mostly people have too many ambitions, and it's not that they don't have they don't have good models. Mm -hmm. They often have uh, too many ambitions to choose from. And uh, yes, in the West, but I've noticed it's a huge problem. And I would say that's one of the reasons why I say the Jordan Peterson phenomena is so wide prevalent. Mm. Now he. He's speaking, although now when females attend his talks and you can see the comments on his talks, by females also, but it's mainly men. So I, my understanding is that uh, mm, one of the things I talk about in journaling is that, uh, you know, start with where you are. Mm. So start with where you are. So. You know, in the Bhagavad Gita 17th chapter, Krishna talks about austerity of the mind. And there he says, satisfaction, manaha prasad, is austerity mm -hmm. of the mind. So what it means is that satisfaction is not just an emotion that we feel, it's also a decision we make. Mm. It's also a decision we make. So, okay, I mean, I don't have good male models, but whatever I have, let me start with that. So certainly, I would say that that, that demoralization uh, has definitely been there. And because I would say that I haven't experienced it so closely firsthand, mm -hmm. either in my life or in the lives of those immediately around me, I noticed it in in the, the young people I interact with in, in America. Yeah. But uh, I won't be able to say too much about it. Okay, let me Broadly, ask it in this way. I'm going to ask it in a way that I think you would have a lot to say about it. 
I'm I'm reading an interesting book. I have a a quota this year to read 30 books, um, just to get myself back in the habit of reading a lot. And also, honestly, like you, I do appreciate words. I like discovering new words and I like using, you know, cool vocabulary. So I've been getting into reading a lot of, and I like to read older books, not ones so much from present time, but like, you know, 19th century, early 20th century book author. So I'm reading this one book called The Sickness Unto Death by Soren Kierkegaard. And we got it from another guest on Arise, um, Rasanath, who used this book as some part of the template for building his business. So it made me interested in the book. In any case, it talks about despair as the main topic, but and then he has a statement, which I really appreciate it. And it's relating to the question that I'm asking. Um, he says here, um, Imagination, okay, what feelings, understanding, and will a person has depends in the last resort upon imagination, how he represents himself to himself. Imagination is reflection, so the reflective self, the self's representation of itself in the form of the self's possibility. And I really was like, I don't know, I really resonated with that definition of imagination, how the self, I guess, reflective self, it represents itself to itself. And so how can journaling be used to improve the image of oneself? So I'm keeping it general. My question was more specified to men, but just maybe keeping it general, how, how, does, how can journaling be used to improve the self image? Because it seems that a lot of us represent ourselves to ourselves in ways that are not very helpful for us living, you know, happy lives. So how can we use journaling as a tool to mm. uplift the self image so that we can do respond better and not do things that aren't worthy of us? You know, and, and yeah, and do things that are worthy of us because we have a healthy self image. And I want to say here, and I, I do want to bring in this angle because I can hear we have a largely devoted audience. And so I can hear this angle, you know, well, we're not the body, we're Krishna's servant, you know, that should be enough, you know, understanding what the truth of the actual self is, that should actually be enough. And the truth's potential and divinity, that should be enough. But we are, this show is about the intersection of our, our potential and our reality, the things that we're actually dealing with. And so it does seem that this could be something useful, some useful thoughts behind journaling as a way to improve the self-image, even the conventional self-image, you know, scaling it up to the spiritual okay. self-image. How might we use journaling mm -hmm. to do that? This is just a different way of asking the same question and broadening the terms a little bit. Yeah, okay. That's a, thank you for generalizing the question. <laughs> so just to, play with the, <laughs> just to play with the word self, yes. I feel that journaling, journaling is the self having fun with the self. <laughs> That's what I see generally, guys. <laughs> generally, is the self having fun with the self. Mm. So I think Einstein said something like that: creativity is having intelligence is is intelligence having fun with itself, something like that. Mm. So, but so one of the things I find with journaling is that when you talk about this negative self-image, so that is the cynic speaking within us. Mm. Right. So the way to deal negative the negative uh, self image is to ascribe that image to the cynic. Now, when I'm ascribing to the cynic, I'm not saying it is wrong. There mm. are times when the cynic is right also. Hmm? Right. And it could be that 90 times out of 100, the cynic is right. But just <laughs> recognizing that this is a cynic's voice, hmm? that's very right. helpful. Because just to take another metaphor for this point, now if you when uh, I do try to write regularly. Now, sometimes writers experience a writer's block. Uh, and one of the reasons, or not just one, you could the main reason, there could be underlying reasons behind it, but the main way in which the writer's block comes up is that we could say there's this creative side within us and there's a critical side within us. Mm. A, am I frozen or am I visible? Am I You're audible? visible. You're visible. Am I audible? You're yes. audible also. Okay. Okay, thank you. So there is this. So there is, you could say, the sin, there is the dreamer within us, the creative voice within us on one side. And then there is the critical voice, the cynic within us. So generally, when writer's block happens, 
that is that is as soon as the creative side speaks something the critical critical voice the critical side starts critiquing it <laughs> it doesn't allow it to develop right so so what one of the ways to get out of the writer's block is a simple formula first first get it out then get it right <laughs> so that means if i would write out a topic just no filter no censor just get it out whatever you want so we uh, we say in writing that you know you can edit a bad page but you can't edit a blank page <laughs> <laughs> right so applying the same what what we apply to writing to journaling so now it could be that uh, i might i mean i get it out i might write 5000 words and out of the 5000 words i might just get about maybe 200 words are what are good and everything else is okay mediocre or not really usable mm. but at least i got the 200 words so when i started writing this geeta daily articles my primary writing inspiration and uh, guide is jayadwait maharaj so i asked maharaj that uh, that many times i i don't feel what i have written is very good so so should i keep writing so maharaj told me something at that time he said that say if you write an article every day hmm, 30 articles you'll write a week write in a month so out of those maybe five will be things which you feel embarrassed you wrote them <laughs> maybe 20 will be okay but five you will be happy about mm. <laughs> however if you don't write those 30 articles in a month you may not write even those five articles that you are happy about you may write only one or two articles so the point i'm making here is that that once we identify this is a cynical voice we free the dreamer from the cynic mm. that means okay i have a negative image of myself that that is true but in spite of that negative image what can i do what mm. can i do right now so once we so that is the basically there are dialogue between the uh, the realist and the dreamer so generally even if we start doing small small things one of the one of the biggest causes of discouragement i find is that we devalue our small successes we devalue our small successes so if i decide that i'm going to read every day for 1 hour and i succeed for 30 days instead of appreciating you know now appreciating means we're not like simply patting ourselves on the back <laughs> but it's this <laughs> it's more like the reflective self appreciating that the impulsive self didn't get so much in the way hmm so instead of that what happens is i did it for 30 days but will i be able to do it for the next month then on the 31st day if i don't do it i forget the fact that i succeeded for 30 days <laughs> and i beat myself up for the fact that i failed on the 31st day right <laughs> so i find that valuing small successes mm. so that is critical and if we could just get the cynic off the back of our back enough to value small successes now the cynic may be true in the sense that we maybe we are in a position where we have not had any big successes hmm. and maybe the the cynic is true in the fact that we made a mess of many things in our life but that doesn't mean that everything we did was bad that doesn't mean we have made a mess of everything in our life hmm. so we can't silence the cynic completely and maybe we shouldn't because the cynic is all will correct us when we need to hmm. but if you can just silence the cynic enough to value even our small successes that will start nourishing the dreamer within us okay i could do this then i can do more i can mm -hmm. do more so i find this quite often in this, the for me the cynic's voice come most prominently uh when i think i have given a very good class and and sometimes you know, after the <laughs> <laughs> I just, I've already could tell I can relate to this. 
<laughs> and then i give a good class and nobody come after the class appreciate it <laughs> exactly <laughs> so so one of the things that uh, one of the incidents that made me realize this is that once i i was speaking on a particular topic and i was very absorbed when i was preparing for the class i would say one of the most absorbed phases of my krishna consciousness very i then i delivered the class also at least i felt i was very absorbed and then after that when nobody was appreciating i was feeling so annoyed and then it struck me it struck me at that time you know does it really matter mm. does it really matter so much mm. you know i came here to be krishna conscious and i was krishna conscious when i was preparing the class mm. i was krishna conscious when i was delivering the class now i'm not saying it doesn't matter you know maybe there is something which we could do to improve our presentation maybe we could do something to connect with the audience mm. but just that that you know okay i can do something more to connect with the audience but in the past it was all good when i was absorbed in preparing it was good when i was absorbed in delivering it was good so what happens is that if i had not caught the cynic at that time the all the good that was there in that it would have been completely mm. lost so the cynic is true maybe my class was too philosophical so i thought it was very good but maybe it was too intellectual for the audience so they didn't appreciate it so i can simplify my content that's fine but i was absorbed so what happens is the cynic takes one bad thing and paints everything in black so that's why i think the negative self image we have to start by by preserving whatever little positive is there mm. whatever positive is there within us that's why the simple step is value small successes mm. value small successes and one way i i try to do it is to not become egoistic is you no know, I, i mean maybe i'll talk one more thing about using journal for journaling for praying yeah that's so, yes i do that a lot i'll come to that but one thing is that we could just say you know thank you krishna for enabling me or blessing me to do this so if we want to don't want to say simply think that it's egoistic to appreciate ourselves for what we have done appreciate the success that we have got to say thank you krishna for enabling us to do it so mm. we could put it that way also to be maybe to make it more krishna conscious but valuing the small successes is so important mm. otherwise you know there is in krishna consciousness we often have quite high standards and we all are struggling with those standards at different degrees so if we just focus on the things that areas where we are off it's it's very easy to become discouraged yeah and uh, and uh, and you know in one sense arjuna at the start of the gita was discouraged and we could say that he was un krishna conscious so and by the end of the gita he became encouraged right so rather than thinking of discouragement as you know there is so much wrong with me there are so many ways i am not krishna conscious that's why i should be discouraged but mm. that thinking itself is a lack of krishna consciousness yes there are so many things wrong with me but still krishna is giving me an opportunity to practice bhakti still krishna is there in my heart still there is an opportunity for me to move ahead so one of the biggest dangers i find in journaling this i cannot uh, cannot warn enough about it is sometimes journaling can become a way to reinforce our negative labels about ourselves mm. Mm. that means if i find that i am lazy and every day i journal about all the ways in which i was lazy <laughs> better don't journal then stop journaling don't journal at all Mm. so i feel that all the journaling as a tool for us to get out of our mind that the mind itself can use journaling to gain more control over us <laughs> so <laughs> so that would be a broad answer about the negative self image nice thank you um i have a i have a few other things here i don't know kumar avatar if you were thinking of anything specific that or a particular angle you would like to go go ahead bro i'm just having a i'm just having a great time hearing this profound discussion i was um just cuz you brought it up journaling as prayer um 
it, it struck me that it's kind of like a form of viknapti. So in in, in, Bhak, in Bhakti Arsamrita Sindhu, we hear about the different angas of bhakti, and one of them is the viknapti one, which is like, hmm. which is translates as submission. And I heard about it that um, submission means like like submitting a report card. You know, like you're making a submission means like you were submitting a report, report card. And then there are three types. You know, one type is basically a prayer asking for bhav, bhakti, or love of God. One type is danya bodhika, like a humble submission of one's danya, like wretchedness. And, and then another type is kind of after you awaken love, you are like praying for something very specific in a relationship with Krishna. Yeah, love samayi. So then it, it struck me that, that journaling was could be like a viknapti practice and so when i started journaling i used to always just start my journals as dear krishna and i would use it as an opportunity to like submit the things that were going on with me mostly internally but also externally this happened that happened i'm going through this right now i don't really know how to process this maybe you can give some and i would kind of journal like this as a sort of viknapti practice um yeah i guess is that useful i guess what do you think about that? Because you know the questions come in, why are all these seminars about journaling now? Where is it mentioned in our bhakti shashras and so on? So I kind of connected journaling to this Viknapti practice. Um, I'm just giving a submission to Krishna regularly. And, um, but one thing I did notice when doing that is that, <laughs> and maybe this is the cynic voice that you're talking about. You know, journaling, I would do like freehand where you just kind of just write, you know, sort of psychic e evacuation. I don't think I did a lot of psychic <laughs> excavation. So it just became kind of repetitive. You know, and I've heard this, this thing come up for a lot of people. Like when I journal, it just starts to get a little bit repetitive. And in my head, the cynic took the form of Krishna. And it was like, bro, again, same thing. <laughs> you were already for two weeks been writing about this. Like you want to submit something else. And so then that kind of maybe slowed me down a little bit. So yeah, when you're doing journaling, if, if one is trying to approach journaling as a regular practice for informing their inner life, um, how do they get around this? It's getting repetitive. It's just the same thoughts, the same things coming up, or, or they just got to do a variety. You got to okay. write a scripture. Sometimes you got to do this. Like, what's, what's your thing on that? Okay. That's a very important question. So I would say that, you know, journal is a very personal thing. Right. So broadly, there are various things we could journal about. So there could be, you could journal about events. Sometimes some events are traumatic, they're transformational, they're disorienting. Mm. So the way I differentiate between events and decisions is, events is where we don't have much agency. It just happened to us. <laughs> Deci decisions is where we, we have to make a decision. Maybe which ashram I'm going to be, who, with whom I'm going to be in a relationship, who I'm going to be initiated by, whatever. We have so many decisions to make. What career do I want to go in? So the events, decisions, and even if nobody journals anything, I strongly recommend doing this journaling of vision and mission at least once in one's lifetime. <laughs> but, you know, okay, where would I like to be? in my relationship with Krishna, in my contributions in this world, mm. after, one year, after 10 years. Now we may say that, how do I know? Life is so unpredictable. That's why the question is not where I will be, where would I like to be? Mm. Okay? Where would I like to be? So, so I feel this gives us a lot of stability. So in general, in life, plans may not work, but planning works. <laughs> so <laughs> plan do this, do this, do this. It may not work, but planning overall gives us a sense of direction. Mm. Or so even if okay, I could not do the ten things I planned, but at least I kept moving in this direction. So this is very helpful, vision and mission. Hmm? Mm. And then this is about people. This is helpful, especially I would say in two extremes. If there is someone in our life who trouble who's troubling us big time for whatever reason, <laughs> then it's uh, you know, it can be very it can fill us with a lot of resentment and negativity. Right, and absolutely. 
so you know one of the senior leaders in our movement he he journals regularly and i talk with him so he said that you know i have a cupboard full of uh, physical journals and i have written that i have written in my will that all these journals should be burned with me <laughs> <laughs> so i asked him why is that so he told me that i have used my journaling largely to process my anger <laughs> <laughs> right wow that's very helpful so there actually. is a lot of anger towards a lot of people in my journals <laughs> and <laughs> so i wouldn't want them to read that so mm. i find that uh, you know just uh, journaling about people especially people who are whom we can't uh, say get out of our life for whatever reason but if you have to still work with them the journaling helps us to see that you know maybe the last 10 memories were 10 interactions were terrible but before that i did have some good interactions with them there mm. is i can't see anything good in this person right now but there is some good so we can find ways to work with people you know it's what happens is broadly speaking journally what it does is it we have a particular image like you talk about images we have a image of people and especially if somebody has dealt with us harshly that image is largely negative but when we journal about that person we start noticing you know maybe this is too harsh what i'm writing this person is not as bad as i'm writing over here <laughs> oh my god <laughs> right <laughs> so it at least balances our negative attitude toward people mm-hmm. and then of course there are issues in issues we like to talk about habits you now we have certain anarthas we are trying to overcome we are trying to develop some good habits so we could journal about habits so now if uh, i decide that i want to read scripture every day so just after if you spend 50, uh, one hour reading just journal 5 minutes about how the reading experience was mm. and uh, maybe we could highlight the days when our reading experience was very good and revisit those on the days when we don't feel inspired to read so that could be about issues and this last part is about creativity so this is especially for those who are like i like to write so you know i just uh, if i get one idea i just let my thoughts flow about that idea mm. and sometimes the starting idea is not good enough not too good but while exploring that idea i get a some other idea which is much better so this is a whole universe in itself but there are many ways in which you can journal so i would say the monotony in journaling comes when we think of journaling simply like a report but when we do focus journaling then i feel the largely the monotony goes away mm-hmm. and and all these are i would say significant issues to journal about but something which we could start with on a if somebody just wants to keep a daily journal this is what i recommend two things you know that we could just note four things in in a day so what was the best thing that happened during the day and what was the worst thing that happened during the day and not just note that but note why i consider it the best and mm. why i consider it the worst you know mm. just note doesn't really help that much but why did i feel so strongly about it that helps us understand ourselves and then so this is in general in our life we interact in two ways with the world the world does some things to us and we do some things in the world so the other part of this is we journal about the best thing that i did in the day and the worst thing that i did in the day and why did i think this to be the best thing and why did i think this to be the worst thing so i feel that this way of journaling helps us get a sense of closure at the end of a day mm. okay this is how this day was and also it helps us feel that not only we get a closure for the day but we come closer to ourselves okay i have understood myself better so i find this form of journaling because each day in its own way is new 
and the good the best thing and the worst thing is not usually repeated exactly the same way so mm. this can also is another way to keep the journal format fresh so in i mean if i were simply writing what happened in the day i would be bored to death while journaling i can't do that so <laughs> so i, I think right. that as we keep exploring you know these i just gave some tools some ideas but as we keep start as we start journaling we will ourselves find what are the ways in which journaling works best for us okay wow i feel like i feel like this is less of a podcast and more of a workshop <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. With, with all the PPTs so and just, just the clarity of the yeah. clarity Sorry, of ahead. presentation, and um, I, I yeah. Anyway, that's a compliment. You know, it's just like I I feel like I'm just in a workshop taking. I'm like, okay, I got to note this. I got to note this down. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. <laughs> You know, maybe yeah, I should I'm, stop I'm speaking just, so much. And let both of you speak. No, 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 no. I'm just experiencing, Prabhu, that you're like that. You're sharing so much value, and there's like there's so much um, intellectual compatibility between you and Jai Jagannath, Prabhu, and it's like you know, just he's he's really facilitating that very nicely. So, I, I honestly, I feel I should just be as quiet as possible to just give you the space to share as much value as you can and. Um, definitely those that are with us are, are appreciating very much. Uh, what, just, yeah, just to reinforce, that, not reinforce, maybe echo that point that uh, somehow uh, journaling has helped me maybe tone down my intellectual content a little bit also. Hmm. Because somehow uh, Maybe I, I don't just have intellectual ability, I have intellectual conditioning. <laughs> what that means is that, right. <laughs> that if something is explained simply, I get bored with it. <laughs> I, get, I, I immediately get bored with it. But there are some times when I hear classes, and if the class is very simple, the only way I can survive in that class <laughs> is by re-articulating by re-articulating in my mind that same point in a more intellectual way. So, <laughs> no. But... Do, you, do you do the same thing? Are you relating to this? I am, I am definitely relating to I Honestly, i definitely gotten better at just appreciating simplicity of presentation. But yeah. probably in 20, like between 2010 and 2015, especially, I was very, like, very much... <laughs> The same. That's why I'm laughing about it so so much. No, so, so as you know, uh, the, why I was telling this is that actually journaling helped me to identify my intellectual conditioning. Mm -hmm. So there is there is a there is a British author. I forget his name. So he won some award for one of his books, and then there was a very abstruse passage in his book, which the award award giving committee they asked him, "What do you mean over here?" And then he read that passage once and he read it a second time and he read it a third time. And he said, when I wrote this, God and I knew what it meant. <laughs> now only God knows what it means. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> now why I'm telling this is I experienced the same thing with my journaling. Mm. I look at my journey. What have I written over here? <laughs> so, you know, if I can't understand what I've written, how do I expect my audience to understand what I'm writing or what I'm speaking? So, <laughs> mm. so in one sense, sometimes something is an ability, but say that same ability can be a conditioning also. Mm. So, like some devotees do kirtan, and they sing in such complex tunes. Oh and that kirtan God, is not participation. That, <laughs> that kirtan is not participatory; it's performatory. Yeah. <laughs> just observe them. So I would say that it's not a bad thing, but it's just that even if we have some conditionings, I think journaling helps us identify that. Mm -hmm. So that was just I was reflecting on the point you mentioned, Karunathar, about 
<laughs> intellectual side yeah yeah no, that's great i you know another reason why i'm why i'm actually keeping quiet is because i shaitanya charan prabhu i'm i'm very fascinated by you you're you're just like a you're just a really fascinating individual and i have all these like super personal questions that i'd love to ask you but it's just not the time and place and you know i just i i i hope that one day we'll we'll get to meet in person and we can have a conversation <laughs> jai do you have anything else you wanted to bring a uh, topic related yeah my i mean my my final thoughts were just how do you use this as a tool for mentoring because you know that's something that um you know some of us do or either like intentionally or just by circumstances you end up in the position where you're kind of like a mentor for others um mm. or your father a father or even a mother yeah. and you're you're taking you're kind of taking care of a dependent and you're trying to help them to grow and come into their themselves in a healthy way and so on so i was just curious how do you administer all these tools to someone you're mentoring like is there a technique of distribution so to speak of giving yeah administering the medicine and generally so to speak or is it just i mean i know it's very yeah, personal but i was just kind yeah. of, i guess curious of a general approach that you usually like to take when mentoring okay uh to be honest i would say that i haven't used journaling in mentoring at a personal level so much i'll explain mm -hmm. why i'll also explain what i have done you know i i was a mentor counselor when i was in india when i was in one brahmacharya ashram but there things were the whole council system and everything was very structured mm. so there was not much room for innovation so i couldn't use it there and then after that mostly uh, last few years i have been traveling extensively so i have been more of a teacher than a mentor to people specifically on a one to one level mm. but having said that so i would say that i'm not a mentor for many people but for those who with whom i have done that i have found two three things first is that uh, if they are battling with some issue then there is a particular way of mentoring so generally i ask them to keep a track of not just uh, you know how they messed up with that issue because that is very depressing and you, but still you have to keep track of it because otherwise you know we may not understand how deep we are in the water so sometimes keeping track of uh, how that issue is troubling us is helpful but also while keeping track you know we all know okay if i have this weakness i have this strength also okay that you know i when i am faced with this provocation i just i just get overwhelmed but say this is my source of strength and if i hear classes i feel very enlivened if i if i associate with xyz devotee that strengthens me so while dealing with the issue if somebody is keeping track of their weakness i very strongly recommend that keep track of how you are engaging with your strength also mm. and i find that the more a person starts engaging with the strength so rather than saying that um, you know i will not i will not spend time on the social on social media or i'll not do this i'll not do that i'll not surf the net at random or whatever you know make a more positive that right, okay i will read scripture every day for this much time for half an hour one hour two hours whatever i can so keeping track of that positive resolutions is relatively is relatively easier easier on the heart we don't feel burden yeah i did this i could do more of this mm. so that's with respect to issues specifically if they're dealing with issues and another ma major thing is decisions that's the time when i find people need the mentoring the most mm. and you know for example uh, which ashram i am going to go into or which spiritual master i should be initiated by or you know, whom I, if i am going to enter i'm going to marry whom should i marry what career should i pursue these are serious questions with big consequences so at that time i i recommend the process 
uh, that is that first get all your thoughts out just write these down and if you have a particular time frame so if you have 3 months in which you have to, after within which you have to make a decision then in general if we are in the mode of passion or ignorance and if we think about big issues at that time all it does is burden us down right because in the mode of passion or ignorance you just can't think about big issues so so i found that indecision paralyzes so many devotees should i do this or should i do that should i do this or should this or that so one way to deal with that is to to compartmentalize the time for deliberating on decision making that means say once i just write down everything maybe it, it takes me 3 hours 4 hours 6 hours write everything down keep it keep it at one place and then decide every week i'll spend 1 hour deliberating on this hmm. and then during the week if we get a thought up if we start thinking about it now we quickly analyze is this a new thought if it's the same thought stop thinking about it if it's a new thought something i didn't think about oh this this particular issues note it down don't think about it at that time because as i said thinking about big issues in the mode of passion and ignorance simply disempowers and frustrates us serious issues need to be thought out in a mode of goodness mm. so then and during that, that one hour when we are spending on deliberating the issue hmm, maybe just pray sometime pray for some time before chant a few rounds do something which brings us to the mode of goodness do that for me 10 15 minutes also and then engage seriously with that issue so then okay reread what you have written maybe you will want to nuance it edit something place it in different ways so again you could use the framework of the three voices the skeptic the cynic the, the dreamer and the realist whatever way you use it but try to process it so the way i see it is that like first when we just get everything out it's like a snapshot of our mind <laughs> and our mind is a mess so the snapshot is also messy but each week we revisit it we start placing things okay this goes here this goes here goes here the mm. snapshot starts becoming clearer and clearer mm. and then if you do it every week maybe spend one hour and at the end of 3 months you will have a much clearer picture much clearer picture okay this is where i am at now this process doesn't guarantee right decisions nothing there is no guarantee of right decisions in the world at all but what it guarantees is a uh, is two things one is after we have taken the decision we won't constantly keep second guessing ourselves because we wrote down you know okay these are the reasons why i'm doing this we won't keep second guessing ourselves and if we start second guessing we can look back at the reasons sure i did all the analysis and i find second guessing can be very very damaging <laughs> especially you know at least in india there was a quite a vibrant brahmachari ashram it's still a vibrant brahmachari ashram but when say when some devotees change from the brahmachari ashram to garhasta ashram they often feel maybe i did something wrong and if you're thinking that and entering into garhasta ashram it's very damaging sure. that's also ashram yeah. that's also a place where you get ashray of course so right. second guessing at that time is second guessing a irreversible decision like that that can be <laughs> in, immensely self destructive right so if you ha- have the reasons and that helps us avoid second guessing and then secondly sometimes things really change in life you now i decide to do a particular service or i decide to go to a particular place and then i find the reality there is very very different from what i thought that if we decide that okay this decision was not right and i have to change it then we don't do it impulsively we don't do it out of frustration we realize okay this was the information i had at that time based on this i took the decision but now i have got all this this things have changed this new information has come up mm. so we may course correct at that time but don't do it through frustration we do it with through a proper process of deliberation so that way i find that uh, decision making the the it's almost not just a burden but it can be an agony so the agony of decision making can be substantially decreased through journaling <laughs> 
so those are i think those are two plays i found many devotees have told me it's been very helpful for them hmm. dealing with issues and arriving at uh, arriving at decisions that they can at least live with if not live for those decisions <laughs> right <Wow. laughs> at least live with if not live for <laughs> Hare <laughs> Krishna. I think you like words also, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. You notice yeah, that? <laughs> it's just funny. Your word ciphering is funny to me. Well, that I mean, that's all I got. I thank you very much, um, Chaitanya Charan, for this um this illuminating seminar. <laughs> yeah. <Of course. laughs> I'm just I, I'm just gonna listen to it many more times. Actually, I, I feel like that so many people, yeah, so many um myself included but so many people in my life that i feel i can really um that really need to hear this this advice and get these practical tools yeah kamania devi is one of our she's one of our regular recent listeners and thank you so much for so nicely um yeah just giving us a solid synopsis of the <laughs> of the session in the comment section we really appreciate it kamania thank you Okay, um, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, Just, we are uh, very case, sorry, sorry. Yes. Just one minute. So, in case you know, I'm going to do a. If somebody would like to explore journaling a little bit more, with the Bhakti Center, I'm doing a journaling yes. course for journaling to study this scriptures better. That's going to be immediately after, uh, immediately after the Yatra festival. Yeah, I think those dates. Uh, okay, June twenty first. Yeah, those dates might change slightly, <laughs> okay. but uh, that's a. So the yoga of writing is what is I had done four courses on journaling till now. Mm. First is like the introduction, the yoga of writing, the journaling for self understanding. Then second is journaling for self transformation, which is like mm. journaling about issues. And third was journaling uh, for better study of scriptures. So that is the one which I'm going to do with Bhakti Center. And the fourth course which I'm doing with the Govardhan Eco Village. Of course, all these are online, so anybody can join. This is. This is probably among the most devotional courses I have done till now. It's journaling to make our memory our treasury. Mm. So to make our memory our treasury. So basically, I'm going to talk about two things. You know how to process our bad memories, and to even if we can't get rid of them, to put them aside, and then how more importantly, how to cherish our good memories. Even in bhakti, we have had many wonderful experiences. But somehow our mind just pushed us in the background and we forget them. Maybe we are part of a, maybe we went to a holy place. Maybe we had a very good class. We are part of a kirtan. We had darshan. So how to cherish those memories? Mm. Because bhakti is ultimately about remembering Krishna. So how to make our memory our treasury? That's so. Both these courses are going to be soon. In, I'm on my Facebook page. You'll get the information about the courses also, in case you would like to join. So, thank you very much for this opportunity. For sharing and uh, you know, it's a. I feel that a podcast directed specifically for uh, thoughtful, introspective individuals. Uh, there are many podcasts going on across now. I think podcast platforms have taken off, but your podcast often goes deep into things. The podcast with Hari Parshat Prabhu and several other podcasts, especially the podcast on the position role of women. Also, it yeah. was uh, quite uh, <laughs> stimulating. <laughs> so I'm grateful to be here, and thank you for this opportunity to share something. Hare Krishna. Hare Prabhu, Krishna. we have one. Thank we you. just have one question from from Kamania here. Um, might you plan to offer it again for European friendly time zones? Okay. Mm. Yes. Certainly, I can, we can plan that. You know, I just had a discussion with Sutapa Prabhu from London, so he also uh -huh. wants to do something like this. So probably if we do it from London, one of the forums, then that will be European friendly. Yes, I've got that request okay. before. I'll definitely plan to do that. Thank okay. you. Okay. Very, very nice. Thank you so much, Prabhu.